Hey guys, um, tonight we're going to be going over sedatives and paralytics and kind of how we manage uh, these medications when a patient is on a mechanical ventilator or in the ICU. So I'm going to start by kind of talking about some of the classes and um, the way that uh, these medications are classified. Um, now, these medications are going to be some of the most common seen in the intensive care units or critical care units. Um, they have a lot of safety and um, other precautions that we're going to have to keep an eye out. Now, always align this with what maybe your professor is teaching you in class. If there's some of these that they're like, well, you don't need to know that in depth, then feel free to kind of skate on by. But I just want to teach you about kind of what's common and what's deadly um, with these medications. So um, all of these are continuous IV drips, but some of them can also be given as an IV push, um, you know, but um, as a whole, most of the time when patients are on a ventilator, they need continuous sedation. So um, the different classes of medications we can use, we can use sedatives, we can use analgesics, um, paralytics, and then there's other medications that we can use as well that are more like anti-anxiety. And so let's kind of break these down into the different classes. Oh, and by the way, um, you know, if you guys remember Michael Jackson propofol, um, you know, that's where most people remember propofol is from, uh, you know, the story of Michael Jackson's uh, demise. Um, so that's why that picture's there. If you're not familiar with pop culture and kind of wondering why is there a picture of a pale man in a bottle of propofol. <laughs> So um, sedatives. So sedatives are going to be one of the most common medications used. So these are meant to relax the patient. A lot of them are also what we call hypnotics, which means they make it where you're not going to remember what's going on, which most people, when they have a breathing tube, they do not want to remember that experience. Um, but, um, you know, these are great for, you know, short term um, needing, uh, you know, that uh, in small doses. But, you know, when they have to be used long term over time um, at high doses, they definitely can have some dangers. So a couple things to know about each of these. Propofol has a very fast metabolism, so that's really good to use. Like when people are in surgery, it goes in their system and it comes out of their system pretty quickly. We need to monitor their heart rate and blood pressure really closely. It is a respiratory depressant um, and it can cause them to um, stop breathing if that's why they need to be on a ventilator while on that medication. It also has a high fat content. So um, kind of an interesting fact is that when patients are on propofol um, and they're in the hospital, we're also um, having to kind of compare what they're getting from the propofol, how much propofol they're on in their fat from their nutrition to make sure that they don't get too much fat. Because this is literally kind of like, um, it's made of, it's like, it's literally um, the substance itself is made of fat. Um, so uh, it has to, we have to use a special tubing um, at most hospitals. And um, we, and we usually change that tubing every shift um, because it really clumps very easily. And then we just have to be careful. And at long term, we would have to watch the patients um, you know, lipid levels and make sure that this is not negatively affecting those if they needed to be on, on this over time. There's also medolazam, um, which is also known as Versed. Um, and, you know, with this one, this is one of the ones that's very, has a very hypnotic quality. So people that are on um, medolazam commonly report when they wake up, um, like uh, very, very crazy hallucinations and dreams while they were on that medication. So there's a higher risk of delirium. So as the nurse, we're really going to need to be there for that patient and try to um, protect for their safety and help reorient them. Um, it also lowers the blood pressure. So we we'll want to keep a close eye on that. Um, ketamine is used in, um, you know, where I work right now, we're definitely using it a lot more. Um, it's, it can be used for pain and it can also be used for what we call conscious sedation. So if we have a patient that comes in with a trauma or a fracture, um, we can kind of use it to like, um, you know, kind of keep them calm and kind of out of it a little bit where they're not going to feel any pain. Um, and we can like maybe set like um, if they have like a hip fracture, we can set it in place or things like that. Um, but it can also be used for continuous sedation. Uh, we want to monitor their blood pressure closely because it can drop that. And then there's also lorazepam Azepam, also known as Ativan. And everyone always says you want to take a ride on the van, the Ativan, you know, because uh, this medication, um, it definitely is an anti-anxiety and it helps to um, kind of ease um, if a patient's really tense and struggling or you're, they're kind of fighting the ventilator. And again, we want to monitor their blood pressure. So you can see as, whole, as a whole, like a lot of these sedatives, they have a lot of the same side effects. They're going to help with the same kind of things. And, you know, you don't need to, um, you're not going to be the one that's going to say, hey, I need this drug. Um, the doctor's going to make that decision based on the patient's history. But what you need to know is what do I need to monitor? So like with propofol, it lowers your heart rate. These patients can get bradycardic. So we need to have them on, obviously they should be already on a continuous EKG monitor, um, but all of these, we're gonna to need to monitor their blood pressure because it can make them hypotensive. 
Um, and if we think about some of the patients that are going to be intubated and maybe need sedation, some of them might already have low blood pressure. So this is where we kind of find a balance where we're trying to get them sedated enough where they can tolerate being on the ventilator, but not also decrease their cardiac output so much that, um, you know, their whatever disease process that they need that breathing tube for, um, it's not getting worse because we're, you know, dropping their blood pressure so much. And everyone's a little different. Keep in mind, you know, those little old gentlemen and ladies, they might be a little bit more sensitive to these medications. So other medications I mentioned, there's fentanyl, um, which that helps with pain and sedation. So this is great for a patient. Like if I have a patient that comes in and they've been in a trauma and they need to be sedated on the ventilator, but they're also probably in a lot of pain because they have a lot of injuries, this kind of does the best, um, you know, with uh, kind of finding the best of both worlds. We need to monitor blood pressure, but I'm out of like all the medications I just listed, this one has one of the worst side effect of respiratory depression. Um, and so, you know, I always want to check to see what mode are they on on the ventilator. I can't tell you how many times I've had a patient on the ventilator and they're breathing spontaneously, like they're in that pressure support mode where they're mostly breathing on their own. I give them, you know, some fentanyl and then they just stop breathing because um, it, it has to, it causes severe respiratory depression. A lot of times I have to, I always try to let my respiratory therapist know, hey, I'm about to give some medication. They may stop breathing. So, and it's, it's not like, um, you know, uh, it's just the, the pretty much the interact, uh, the, you know, intervention that we need to do there is put them on a mode on the ventilator that's going to breathe for them because, you know, the medication is, you know, not allowing their diaphragm to do its job. There's also paralytics and the one that we use most often, um, you know, um, cystricurium, I usually call it Nimbex. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's effectively, this is a um, meta medical paralytic. So in other words, it, um, it paralyzes their muscles so they can relax. So think about patients like ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, or patients that are just really non-compliant with the ventilator, like they're, they're, um, maybe their lungs are really stiff or they're really sick and so their lungs are just not complying and their like breathing is off and you know we the ventilator can't force someone to breathe well we can give more air and volume we can um, tell them to breathe so many breaths at least so many breaths per minute but we can't slow them down um, you know if someone's hyperventilating aside from sedating them we can't slow them down um, and you know so some people they're fighting the ventilator so much that we put them um, you medically paralyze them pretty much saying your muscles need to rest we need to let the ventilator do all the work and um, this is a common medication they're on Keep in mind, we're not going to paralyze someone without sedating them first. How would, uh, how do you think you'd feel if you were completely paralyzed, um, but could feel everything? And that's what happens. So you always like, I would never, no one could pay me enough money. There's no doctor who could convince me. I don't care how much they were yelling at me to give a paralytic without giving sedation first, um, because that is just cruel and unusual. So you always give a sedative first. So usually we'll push some um, of the Versed or the fentanyl um, and then, or, or Ativan, something like that that morphine, something, they just need some sort of um, sedation first, and then they can get the paralytic. Um, and this comes as a, as a drip, and it also comes um, as a push if you just need it temporarily, like we give this sometimes as we're, um, not this particular med, but we give other paralytics when we're intubating a patient. So this last one is what's called um, dex dextamethyl Medine. Sorry, I'm going to say that really badly because I still call it Presidex. <laughs> so um, this is not an opioid. So a lot of doctors are preferring this these days because there's less of those um, long-term side effects and the withdrawal that can happen. Um, it's more of an anti-anxiety medication. It, just like propofol, it can drop your heart rate and your blood pressure. And a lot of people can have like a severe heart rate drop with this. So you need to watch closely, especially if they're already on medications that might drop their blood pressure. The great thing about this medication, this Presidex, is it can be used on non intubated patients. So if I have a patient who's like really rowdy and I need them to be on a medication and I'm trying to get their breathing tube out, but they won't calm down long enough to get that breathing tube out, then I can give this medication and it will help them, um, you know, to, and I can keep it on even after I pull their breathing tube out. Um, and so that it still kind of keeps them calm throughout that process. So it goes a lot smoother. Um, we also use this on patients who aren't intubated that are like, you know, alcohol withdrawal and things like that. It helps to, um, to Increase their um, anxiety and from a lot of that with the physical withdrawal symptoms that they're having. 
So um, when a patient's on a paralytic, oh, excuse me, sorry, got a hair in my face. Um, when a patient's on a paralytic, um, they um, are going to be monitored uh, for, of course, effectiveness of this medication. And we use what's called train of four monitoring. And what this is, is this is going to tell me how paralyzed am I? So remember paralytics, they're paralyzing my muscle. So as the nurse, I want to make sure that they are paralyzed enough but not paralyzed so much that they're like, there's no tone to their muscles. So um, I actually attached this little kind of, um, you know, miniature shock device and don't, don't get scared by it. Nurses do this to themselves. Like they, they've tested it before. It's not like defibrillation. <laughs> it's just a little shock, but it just tests to see if you still have kind of muscle contraction. So usually we do it up here on the eyebrow or we do it on the ulnar, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, side of the hand and uh, or wrist, excuse me. Um, and I want to, before I even start the medication, I need to see kind of what their baseline is because maybe they have some sort of muscle or other deficit. So I want to see what they are and they should, um, we, we count how many twitches that they have. And so in other words, pretty much what I'm doing is I'm attaching two electrodes here and I'm turning electricity on. And then what usually happens is you'll see my thumb um, like twitch four times because um, it sends four pulses. And that's what, I mean, if my muscles are working, you'll see my thumb twitch. Um, with a paralytic, we don't want all that muscle twitching. So usually my goal is I want to see that when I, um, after I start my paralytic, that um, when um, I uh, give that electrical stimulus, then they're going to just have maybe twice that I'm going to see a little bit of muscle twitch, but it's not going to be as um, profound. You're like, you know, it's not going to be, I'm pretty much counting how many twitches they're having and they should have, usually we like um, one to two twitches, um, whereas a normal would be four. So yes, um, that's a kind of a more confusing concept. So if you're not sure about that, you may again not need to know this in depth, but this is something on a day-to-day -day basis if you are do have a patient on a paralytic that you would need to monitor. Um, but keep in mind as a whole, if I have a patient on a paralytic, I can use this, but um, you know, a lot of patients in the ICU, they're, um, they're edematous, like really swollen. Um, they may have a lot of physical issues going on. So a lot of times, and like they're sweaty. And so a lot of times I can't get a good reading. So I need to look overall. The point of giving a paralytic to a patient in the ICU, like I mentioned, is to allow them to not fight the ventilator and to, um, you know, breathe adequately. So uh, I need to look at their breathing. How are they doing? So even regardless of how many twitches that I'm getting, how is their breathing? Um, what do you call them? And like I mentioned there, you know, an accurate reading can be affected by edema, by sweat, um, by larger body habitus or extra tissue, things like that as well. Um, so there's a lot of possible things that could affect it. So overall, I just want to see, you know, that's how like all these medications we just talked about, like some of the concerns with them, but my job is also to monitor, to see how is the patient tolerating this? How, how is this working for them? So for a paralytic, I monitor how well it's going by doing a train of four. And um, again, I'm, I'm usually titrating, uh, you know, to one to two twitches. Um, and then um, I'm also going to just look at their breathing. Are they fighting the ventilator? Are they coughing a lot? Are they, um, are they really restless in bed? If they're on a paralytic, uh, paralytic and they're moving around, your paralytic's not working. Because <laughs> if, if they're on a paralytic, they shouldn't be moving at all, really. Um, you know, they shouldn't be um, sitting there and moving around and, you know, coughing and doing a lot of that stuff. So um, it's just about making sure that they're on enough to where their, um, you know, their uh, lungs can rest and they're not fighting the ventilator, but not so much that it, they can completely lose all of their muscle tone. So how about the other medications? So the other medications, um, you know, like the anal, uh, the um, analgesics and things like that, and the um, uh, what do you call it? The sedation medications. Um, we're going to have an order to titrate per th one of these two scales. Usually, usually we're going to be using what's called the RAS and not the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, but the RAS, the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. And there's also what's called the Ramsey Sedation Scale. Um, and so uh, most of the time, the, every hospital I've ever worked at, we use the the RAS, the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. And what this is, I'm seeing how effective is this medication. So if I'm giving a patient a medication that's supposed to help to sedate them, um, then they should not be restless, agitated, um, you know, very agitated or combative. Most of the time, um, you know, my order for my sedation medications will say titrate to alert and calm or drowsy. 
Um, you know, I, pretty much that's where I want them. I want them calm, you know, not fighting the ventilator, maybe a little drowsy, but I don't want them um, deeply sedated or unarousable. Like, you know, I'm trying to find that happy medium. Because if you remember on the um, nursing care of the mechanically ventilated patient, we talk about the fact that, you know, there is some too much of a good thing. And with that ventil uh, that VAT bundle, the ventilator associated ammonia bundle, I want them on the least amount of sedation as possible. And I want to get that tube out as soon as possible. So this is kind of the scale that I use to uh, measure that. Now for the pain medications, I also can use um, nonverbal scale. So like if I have a patient on a fentanyl drip, I'm going to look at things like facial expressions. Um, uh, what do you call it? Are they restless? Are they coughing or fighting the ventilator? And what's their general muscle tension? Are they tense um, or are they relaxed? And so, um, you know, the CPOTS, this is the, what we call the CPOT scale. Um, and it's the one of the most common that I've used um, when I've been in the hospital. But effectively, I'm going to take that medication and try to see, okay, so um, how's my patient doing? Are they grimacing? Are they tense in their face? What are their body movements? Are they restless or are they um, not moving? moving at all. Um, you know, what is their, um, are they tolerating the ventilator? Are they coughing a lot? Um, are they, um, and if they're not intubated, of course, I can always, um, you know, see if they're like sighing, moaning, crying, or what, whatever they're doing. And then looking at their muscle tension, and then adding that up. And so, um, yeah, that's just kind of, um, it's important to look at these scales just to kind of understand that these scales are what are used to uh, pretty much tell you uh, whether or not um, your medication is being effective. You know, if this number gets super high, um, you know, that usually means that, um, uh, what do you call it? The patient does not have enough sedation. We want this number to be low. We'd love a CPOT of zero where the patient's calm, relaxed, not showing any signs of pain. So I know these medications can be super confusing and a little overwhelming, but just keep in mind as a whole, our goal is to put them on enough sedation so that they're not fighting the ventilator and that they're able to breathe adequately, um, uh, but um, also not putting them on too much where they're knocked out and that it's gonna, they're gonna have all those side effects that they can have of long-term sedation. So um, as you start to interact with these medications more and um, learn kind of how do we assess for that they're working or not, they'll start to all piece together. So I'll see you next time, bye.